in the first quarter of the 1900s. Chemistry and physics were really about the same field. Before then, they had started to make some distinctions between the two, but a chemist was also a physicist, and a physicist was also generally a chemist. And as things progressed from there, chemistry kind of managed to branch off as its own, and physics went its own direction too. But there's still a substantial overlap between the two fields. Now, I bring that up because that's going to give us a little bit of background for where some of these pieces are going to fit. Now, this video is going to be our context building video for the entire course. This course is going to be all about doing measurements in chemistry. So doing an analysis of chemical substances and samples. Now for that we need to be able to say what do we know about a system? What can we find out about the system? And how well can we know it? Now that seems pretty intuitive. But let me break it down a little bit because that's going to give us some idea for what the map of this course will be. What do we know? We're going to use chemistry to understand our samples and to decide what the samples should look like. So we're going to say, okay, if I'm expecting to find caffeine inside of a sample of, let's say, coffee, then of course the first thing we're going to think about, what's the structure of caffeine? And what's it going to look like? So we look at this and we say, hey, look, there's lots of nitrogens. We've got a decent amount of pi conjugation because, remember, nitrogens have that lone pair. We've got double bonds, double bonds. So this whole thing has a big pi conjugated ring. Double bond, oh, well, sorry, electron pair, double bond, double bond, electron pair, double bond, double bond on that atom as well. So you can see that about the only atom that isn't involved in some sort of a pi system is going to be this carbon sitting over here. So, from that we can say, wow, there's a big ring system here with lots of electron density. I'll bet that thing is going to be really good at absorbing in the ultraviolet. It might even have a color back in the visible range. Although, from organic chemistry, we're also pretty used to the idea that most of the things we're making in that class are white crystalline substances. That's just kind of, you know, the standard how it worked. But from this we can say, hey, I'll bet this is going to do a great job of absorbing in the ultraviolet. I can also look at this and say it's not a very symmetrical molecule. It has lots of electronegative atoms around a, caffeine ring, uh, a carbon ring. So I'll bet that there's probably a decent amount of polarity on this. I'll bet this is going to be highly soluble in water. It's going to do a good job of absorbing in the ultraviolet. Uh, and we can start predicting some more and more properties. From that we could say, hey, I'll bet that I could do an extraction on a sample and I can pull this molecule from a polar solvent into a more polar solvent. At least that would be a spot that I would start out guessing. And you know, you'd have to refine the approach from there. The point is that we start looking at the molecule and coming up with how we think the molecule is going to interact with its surroundings. That's part of what we know. The next thing becomes what can we find out. If I can get my caffeine pure, I can measure how much there is. Now, if you remember way back, when we talk about atomic masses, for carbon we said that carbon is 12.001 AMU, aka grams per mole. I'll just put that in just to remind us that the definitions are slightly different. There's a tiny bit of nuance that we very rarely care about, but they're not the, absolutely the same definition, but they're close enough that we just don't bring it up very often. All right, so we've got a certain mass. Well, keep in mind, this is telling us that out of the atoms that are present, most of them will be carbon-12, some small percentage will be carbon-13. However, one of the things we may not have brought up, or you may not remember from Gen Chem, is that the distribution, the percentage of carbon-12 versus carbon-13, is going to depend on where it came from on the planet, and lots of other things. In other words, if we can find out the exact ratio of these two isotopes, and if there's any other isotopes present, we can now find out something about the source of those carbons, and we can probably even figure out where on the planet they came from and when on the planet they came from. Carbon dating. So you can see that because we know something about the molecule, we can start coming up with a list of things that we can find out. And that means if we can find it out, that means we need to go measure those things. 
Now, in the journal Analytical Chemistry, a couple years back there was an uh, editorial written by the editor where he brings up that lots of people out there, maybe not the majority, but lots of people in the field say that analytical chemistry is all about measuring concentrations and nothing else. All of the other properties of a system that you measure, those properly fit into other pieces of chemistry. And he rejected that notion very strongly and said, chemistry is, uh, analytical chemistry is all about the measurement of chemically interesting things. So if we are measuring dipoles, like how big of a dipole a molecule has, that's something that could be done by an analytical chemist. So there's a huge list of things that we can find out. And we're going to talk about lots of these throughout this semester. But the third one is going to be where we spend a decent amount of time early on in the semester. How well do we know this value? Hopefully, you have a little bit of a background in statistics already. If you've taken a statistics class and you're cringing because it was so much more than you wanted to do, I have good news. We sometimes get an ego in the sciences that, hey, we're awesome at numbers and those social scientists, so weak. I want you to pull back from that sort of a notion because the social sciences have to use much more nasty t statistics than we do. Our stats actually stay pretty simple. So all of the deep end of the statistics class pool, we're not really going to wade into that portion too much. We're going to be staying more on the shallow end of statistics. So good news for us. We are going to be using some stats. Now, that said, if you haven't had a statistics class, we will be learning the stats as part of the course. So that's a good news. And since we're going to be doing primarily a workshop-based course, that means that the other people in your group who have taken the class can fill you on on some of the basics. That's one of the big strengths of doing a workshop approach. Okay, so that's kind of a quick introduction to what is analytical chemistry. Now, what are we going to do in the rest of this chapter? Well, chapter one is definitely a heavy review chapter. This is just getting us to remember the first, probably third of the semester of Chem 1. Thinking through things like conversion factors, SI units, metric prefixes, talking about concentration, and those sort of issues. Which means that already you're like, oh good, I don't have to watch the rest of these videos. Please resist that urge because it's been a long time since you've done a lot of these things. And do you remember the exact difference between parts per million, parts per billion, percent, and what a mass percentage is versus a weight percentage versus a volume percentage versus a grams per volume percentage? There's lots of those things that were kind of tricky back then that you've probably forgotten about. So please resist the urge to fast forward through everything let this give you the grounding that you'll need to do well and have a good basis for the rest of the course.